Hello, this is James Roney with James Roney Staters. While I'm waiting for parts and supplies to come in for my magnetic motor, I'd like to share something, or should I say, someone with you, an unsung hero in the world of magnetism. If you've never heard of Francis Bitter before, then let me be the first to introduce you to him through his book called Magnets by Francis Bitter. The Education of a Physicist This book is absolutely fascinating. Francis Bitter was responsible for a lot of things and, and major contributions into the world of magnetism, especially electromagnetism. He headed the Department for the Institute of Magnetism at MIT. He also worked with the Navy in the development and research of anti-mine, magnetic mine technology, in that mines would be dropped into rivers, uh, exploding mines, and they would have a compass on them that pointed to true north. When the steel hull of a ship would pass over these mines, they were resting quietly on the bottom of the river, that needle would deviate away from true north, and suddenly those mines would explode. Um, he's also responsible for this, still this very day, the best electromagnetic design out there for the strongest, uh, for the, the, the strongest magnet available, for the strongest design. In other words, no one's figured out how to make a better electromagnetic uh, device than uh, Francis Bitter. So what I'd like to do here is about a five-minute read. They'll read the opening chapter. The book is very thin, and if, this was, if the opening chapter was printed on a um, standard book, it'd be exactly one page or so in length. Um, I'll give you the International Serial Book Number. I, I have found this. Uh, on the web. I found it on eBay today for $7.95. It was on Amazon, one used copy. What makes this interesting is that the, the information in this book is still relevant to this very day, despite that this was published in 1959. That's over a half a century ago. Um, the Library of Congress catalog card number is 5996111. That's 59 dash 9611. Now, the opening chapter goes as follows A note before you begin Science is a world with many fields to be explored. One of these is magnetism, a subject dealing with one of the many influences that one tiny bit of matter can exert on another. We know as much about magnetism as about anything else in the world, or in the universe for that matter. But when it comes right down to it, we have not scratched the surface, not to any depth, in perceiving the true relationship of magnetism to other kinds of influences that can be exerted from here to there across empty space, nor in breadth, in realizing the complexity of the magnetic interplay of the electronic winds as they blow through outer space or around the atom or even through the lamps and tubes we make and use and accept is trivial in our everyday lives. I shall tell you about magnetism in the most valid way I know, and in an interesting way, I hope, by describing my personal voyage of exploration and how it felt to me. As you read, you will learn a little bit about magnetism. However, you will not learn as much as you would from a long and detailed study of the facts. But you will learn something about magnetism 
and perhaps quite a lot about a man's life and his absorption into his work. My work, it might be better called my fun, always has been, concerned with magnetism. So how did it begin for me? It began as it always must, by learning a language. It began with hard work and due diligence, as well as fun and excitement. By me learning many lessons, for example, the one in my college days as follows. Science and mathematics were easy for me. I did not have to work very hard to get by. My family was not well off, but even in those days, before easy fellowship support, I was able to borrow money to see myself through college. One day, I saw a notice of competition for a cash prize to be awarded for excellence in applied mathematics. If I should win that, it would be a most welcomed addition to my pocket money. I took the competitive exam, and I still remember this cocky feeling I had when I looked around and saw no one I considered to be a serious rival. I was very confident, but when the results were announced, it was not I who had won. Rather, it was an unknown, someone who had not become a member of the discussion groups, the bull sessions, or the argumentative lunch clubs. Rather, it was just someone who was quiet and smart. As I now think back on this time, I am reminded of a children's party that my wife gave recently. One boy was somewhat older than the rest. He was rather disdainful and obviously felt superior. Toward the end of the party, we had a competition to see who was best at tossing cards into a hat. It looked easy. The various children tried with negligible success. At last, it was the turn of the older boy. He strutted up and obviously expected every card to land in the hat. The first went wild. He looked sheepish. The second card went wild. He looked embarrassed. The third, fourth, and the fifth he threw in rapid succession, but all missed. With a bewildered look on his face, he turned to us and he said, Hey, what's wrong? That was just my feeling when I failed to win the competition. Hey, what's wrong? I had not yet learned that single-hearted hard work and devotion and even love were necessary for any success, for any real achievement. If these ingredients are not there, one cannot contribute or benefit as one might. It was a good lesson to learn at the very beginning of my career, and there were many more to come. But let us start at the beginning, learning the language of science. Let me tell you something of what I learned and why it fascinated me. Francis Bitter, The Education of a Physicist, Magnets, 1959. I would also like to bring some other books to your attention here. If you're science-minded, you might find these equally as interesting. A Scientist in the City by James Treffel, that's T-R-E-F-I-L. That is just an incredible book. Just read it and you'll be glad you did. Um, another one underneath here, Building Electrostatic Lightning Bolt Generators by Walt Noon, that's N-O-O-N. That's this book right here. I, um, it's a great book for those of you who love electrostatics like myself. I am heavily involved in a very elite, very little understood area of electrostatics. And because of such, the Windhurst gener static generator and the Van de Graaff static generator 
were not ample enough for me to use to generate the kind of electricity that I needed. So I, like, like the old saying goes, uh, necessity is the mother of all inventions, required me to invent a new static generator unlike any of the other two designs. And I will probably be releasing that later this year. And after I apply for my patent pendant, I'll make them available on eBay for sale. And I'm sure they'll probably get gobbled up because when you see a decent static machine on eBay, uh, they do get gobbled up and people pay good money for those. Six, seven, eight hundred dollars and on up. Well, when you see mine, it's going to blow your mind. And it's one of those things that's so simplistic you would ask yourself, how could it have been overlooked for so long? Anyway, here nor there, the next one down underneath here is by um, Cleve Baxter, Primary Perception. That is a mind-blowing book. Well, let me give you quickly the heads up on how this book, the premise for the book. Uh, Cleve Baxter was the head of the Institute of Lie Detection in Southern California back in the mid to early 1960s. During that time of which he was sitting in his chair one day and he had a corn plant in his office. A simple but odd question came to his mind and he wondered how long does it take for the water from the roots of that plant to make it to the leaf? One of the leaves on the plant. And he said, well I can figure that out pretty quickly because he had the lie detection equipment. Well, partly the lie detection equipment is called the galvanic skin test, which measures resistance on the skin. So he hooked that up to the plant, turned the tape machine on, the, the lie detector, which tape comes out, and watered it, and then sat back down to his chair. Well, shortly after a little bit, there was a major disturbance out in the, the lobby. He raced out there to help the secretary, and he got really... Um, not violent, but he said he was very unnerving, to kind of paraphrase what he was saying. So he came back in his office, he sat down, and he goes, hey, I wonder how my plant is doing. So he looked at the tape coming out of the machine, and he saw these squiggly lines on there that he goes, wait a minute, this is not possible. Or is it? So he stood up, walked over near the plant, took out a cigarette lighter, lit the cigarette lighter, and with full intentions, walk toward the lighter, toward the plant with the lighter to set one of the leaves on fire. Before he got close enough to burn the plant, the needles on the lie detector machine went absolutely nuts, he said. He said it pegged out to the top. He took the thread away immediately. As soon as he did, the needles that were pegged to the top immediately started calming down and went back to their normal resting spot. He was blown away. Thus, I start him on a journey that he worked on for the remainder of his life. He's still alive today, but he's not going to be around much longer. He's way, way, way up in his years. Um, he helped to co-write the book called um, The Secret Life of Plants. Um, anyway, you've got to get this book. This is my copy. It's a self-published book, I believe. I got this directly from Cleve Baxter himself. Uh, the next and last book, uh, is, uh, but not least, is Tesla, Man Out of Time, another great read. Um, this book here covers uh, his, not so much just his experiments, uh, but more about the man himself, along with the war of currents between AC versus DC, the people who lied to him, who cheated, uh, just all the many things that happened. Some of the things that a lot of us don't even know about. Uh, the person who did the research on this just did a wonderful job. Thus the name, Tesla, Man Out of Time. Um, I guess that about covers it all. Um, you're always welcome to, to write me at uh, freemagneticenergy at gmail.com. Unfortunately, some of you will pick my email up and spam me. I mean, let you know that I just delete stuff. I don't open it up. Whatever it is, doesn't matter. Put the word head and magnetism in it or magnet or something like that and I'll at least take a peek and if I don't see it to be a spam then I'll, I'll continue to read it and check it out. I will not open up any attachments sent to me, period. If I don't know you, I'm not opening up anything that's sent to me. Alrighty, that's it. 
This is James Roney with James Roney Staters signing out. Life is short. Thereby, I thank you kindly for your time. Take care. Bye-bye now.